James chapter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 16 through 20. And uh, in fact, this particular study could have been divided into three different studies. And in the past, I may very well have done that because what we have opportunity to look at in these verses is uh, confession and prayer and then restoration. And see, these three all go together, confession of sin, prayer, and restoration. They all work together, and you're going to see how that works in context as we go through this together. So let's begin by reading verse 16, and we'll get into our study. I'll move into verses 17 and 18, and then close with verses 19 and 20. So here in verse 16, James chapter 5, James writes, Confess your trespasses to one another, pray for one another, that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And so, as we've been going through the book of James, last time we were together, James had written concerning suffering and singing, sickness as well as sin. And he had instructed the believers to, when they're sick, to call the elders of the church to pray for them. Now, when he spoke of forgiveness of sins, he was inferring that they had confessed these sins. Uh, when the people were asking for prayer for healing, that's what they would do. They would actually come and they would confess. Notice verse 14, how it said, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. Notice, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So he's already been speaking concerning prayer. He's been speaking concerning confession of sin and healing. This is what he's been speaking of in verses 14 and 15. So verse 16 actually is continuing that thought. Now, again, when he was, was speaking of forgiveness of sins, he was inferring that these people who were coming and speaking to the elders, he was inferring that they would be uh, naturally speaking concerning any things that have been going on in their life that aren't proper because they want to be healed. And so when they would come and speak, I, I want you to get an idea of what would take place because sometimes when you read these things, you may be thinking, well, there must, must have been some formal way of doing this. There must have been some system of doing this where they would come to the elders. Perhaps they would go uh, and have, have certain, certain things done to make this proper. But it, it's more natural than that. What it would have been like is what it is like today is uh, they'll come up and they'll say, you know, I've been going through something. I'm sick. My stomach hurts. I've got headaches. I've got a bad back, whatever. And, uh, you know, I, I'd like you to pray for me. But before we ask for prayer, I, you know, I, I'd like you to also be aware that I've been struggling with certain things. And could you pray for that too? That happens all the time in between services, first and second actually before service, on first service, in between first and second, I'm out here, I'll be walking around talking to people. Very often, they'll walk up and they'll say, you know, I need some prayer, could you pray for me? And I'll say, how are you doing? And they'll say, well, you know, there have been things in my life I'm dealing with. And they may share some personal thing that they want some victory over. it. That's what, that's what would happen. And you have to see it that way. It was very natural. They'd speak and they'd say, I've got these things going on. I haven't been feeling good about this. I've been angry about that. They would speak like that, and that's what would happen. They would come, and they would ask for prayer, and they would open their hearts. And as they would open up their hearts to these elders, the elders would pray for them on their behalf. Uh, that would have been part of their request for prayer because they wanted their prayers to be heard. And they were aware of Psalm 66, verse 18, where it says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And so they would ask for prayer, but they would also confess and say, these are things that are in my life that I want doubt with. And so they would humbly confess their, their sin, if you will, to those elders, not so that they could re receive any forgiveness or what might be referred to as absolution, but because the elders were not the ones who forgive sins. You know, we don't, I as an elder, I'm not the forgiver of your sins. The Bible tells us in Psalm 51 verse 4, Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. And so God is the one who forgives the sin. So they're not asking the elders to be the ones who forgive. 
because they know that sin is forgiven by God. What they were doing is humbly requesting uh, prayer for them, and they were confessing their need because if they regarded iniquity in their heart, they were afraid that it would close the channel between them and the Lord in their relationship. So they wanted it to be something that was pure. And so they were in need of healing, and confession would be part of their prayer. Confession was made so the elders could pray what James called the prayer of faith. And so the humility required for confession placed a person in a position to be healed. And so verse 16 continues with this thought by saying in verse 16, confess your trespasses, notice, to one another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effect of fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So not only was confession of sin made to the elders, but it was also made to one another. Notice that. And that, that practice of confessing to one another reveals fellowship and humility as well as accountability. Now that idea of, of confessing your trespasses to one another, the word trespass also has been translated your sin. It, it is also translated by the word fault, your faults to one another. Well, that particular practice uh, of doing that and actually being open to one another is a foreign thought to a lot of people who go to church today. It's just not going to happen in their life. If, if you're listening right now, you might be thinking, are you kidding me? You're telling me that I had to go and tell a stranger or somebody in the church, confess my faults to one another? That ain't going to happen. No, I, I won't even tell those closest to me, let alone a stranger. And, and that kind of shows, up the, shows us the fragmentation of the body of Christ today. We don't trust one another. We don't we don't love one another. Uh, the church, we need to understand, is more than a place of entertainment, and, and the church members are more than an audience. What we're supposed to be, according to Scripture at least, is a loving, supporting family. Because the Bible teaches us that, that the church is to love one another, to pray for one another, to encourage one another, to correct one another, to fellowship with one another, to support one another. It's filled with, with admonitions for us to have relationships. And so uh, this kind of ministry uh, of praying for one another and sharing our hearts was, was not restricted to simply the elders. It was something that was practiced by them all. They, they would humbly confess to one another. They would pray for one another to be healed. They confessed their sin. They prayed for healing. And they prayed for the healing of both soul as well as their body. They wanted to be a complete person. They wanted to be, to be whole. And, and they, they knew that sometimes our sin that we're involved in can actually lead us to a place of being sick or not well. There are people that are going through things physically because they have been in sin and the guilt is so heavy on their heart that they don't have any joy, they're, they're depressed, they're saddened all the time, they, they have physical pain, and a lot of times it's because they are, they're guilty and they're going through something that is very deep and, and, they're, and nobody, they're not letting anybody know about it. Think about King David in the Old Testament. King David committed a terrible sin. He committed adultery with a woman by the name of Bathsheba. And uh, if you remember the story, David committed adultery with Bathsheba. And she became pregnant. And she came to him and let him know that she was, she was with child. And so David knew her husband. He was one of David's bodyguards, one of his mighty man. His name was Uriah. And so what he did is to try and cover up his sin, he, he told Uriah, he said, why don't you go, Uriah had come off the field, and, and David said to him, why don't you go home and spend time with your wife? He was hoping that he'd be intimate with her and she'd become pregnant, or he thinks, Uriah would think she became pregnant by him and his sin would be covered. But Uriah wouldn't go and sleep with his wife. And so David tried to get him to do it a second time. And Uriah refused to do it the second time. And so finally, what David did is he said, you put Uriah in the hottest part of the battle and then withdraw the troops and, and allow him to be taken down, which took place. And so Uriah went there and he was fighting on uh, behalf of his king whom he loved and, and honored. And, and uh, they withdrew and then he was killed on the battlefield. The word was brought to him, one of your mighty men, Uriah, has died. And uh, David uh, went through a time of of pretending to be mourning and all. And ultimately, uh, he married Bathsheba, and the baby born to David and Bathsheba, well, that baby didn't survive. The baby died. 
But David wrote about that incident, and, and he did so in the Psalms because his, his, his sin and his guilt haunted him, and he became weak and, until he confessed and, and repented. Psalm 51, verse 3, David said, I acknowledge my transgressions. My sin is always before me. My sin is always before me. I wake up, it's there. I go to sleep at night. It's the last thing I think of. It's, it's with me all the time. It, it never leaves me. My sin is ever before me. It's the one thing that, that I can't get rid of. And, and he's speaking about the guilt that he was living in. In Psalm 32, 3 through 5, he said, When I refused to confess my sin, I was weak and miserable. I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide them. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. So when you have gone through something, the confession, it, it, it sets you free. And, and in the case that James is speaking of, they would go to the elders, but they also did it amongst themselves. And they'd say, you know, I've been dealing with this, and and I'm getting sick over it. My body is just not reacting the way it, it should. Would you pray for me? There would be confession because that's what the body of Christ does. And so he says in verse 16, he says, confess your trespasses to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Now notice he says that you may be healed. Now, there's no guarantee for healing for everybody. What we do is, is we entrust ourselves to God to do what is best on our behalf. You see, the prayer of faith is our responsibility, but the healing is always the work of the Lord. And so we come to the Lord and we pray and ask God, and it just may be that he will heal us. Then he moves on to say, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. When he says the effective, that word effective means intense, unwavering. It's faith-filled prayer from the heart of a righteous person. In other words, this prayer comes from deep within. It's prompted by the Holy Spirit, and it's prayed out with passion. Fervent prayer is that intense, sincere petitioning of the Lord. It's that open cry to God. It's like, like those two blind men on the side of the road there by Jericho that when Jesus was passing by, they had asked, uh, who is this? And they said, Jesus is passing by. And the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 20, Verses 30 and 31, behold, two blind men sitting by the road, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, cried out, saying, have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. Then the multitude warned them that they should be quiet, but they cried out all the more, saying, have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. They weren't about to lose their opportunity. Who's that passing by? It's Jesus of Nazareth. And so now's my opportunity. And they didn't whisper this. And when people said, you need to shut up, they didn't get quiet. They cried out all the more. It's a fervent, it's a passionate cry. And, and that's what you do when, when there's something going on in your life. You're not necessarily going to be quiet about it. When you pray to the Lord, you may do so with fervent agony. You may do so with a passion. You may do so with a, with a sense of God. And, and unless you help me, I, I think I'm going to die. God, I need your help. And he's speaking about a fervent, effective prayer here. It's a, it's a prayer that's filled with expectancy. Like Hebrews 11:6 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So it's not a half-hearted kind of, well, Lord, if you got time, could you? No, it's a cry out to the Lord. God, help me. I need you. And he says this is the kind of prayer that is prayed by a righteous man. Now, he's not speaking of a perfect person. He's speaking of the man or the woman who has been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We are made righteous by Jesus Christ. That's something the church needs to wake up to and remember. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, God made him who had no sin, which is Jesus, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so what we have is what is called imputed righteousness. Jesus Christ had no sin. Jesus is the only human being who could point to people and say, which of you can convict me of sin? And not a single person could because he was without sin. Tempted in every way such as we are, but without sin, the writer of Hebrews tells us. And so when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he didn't die because of his own sin. 
He died on that cross on behalf of us because we're sinners. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So when Jesus took upon himself our sin, he took upon himself that which he didn't have in order that he could give to us that which we don't have. So he took my sin and gave me his righteousness. It's called imputed righteousness. He gave to me that which I don't have of my own. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but it's that he saved us by the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit. It's by, it's by grace that we're saved through faith, and that not of ourselves, it's a gift of God, and not of works, lest any man should boast. And so what you did, what I did, if you're a believer in Christ, is you said, God, I'm giving to you my sin, and God says, and I'm giving to you my righteousness. And so you are made righteous by Jesus Christ. There's quite a number of people who are trying to make themselves righteous by trying to do something hard or, or, or do something that requires much from them so they can somehow feel that they became righteous on their own efforts. And God says, that's not how it works. What happens is you have nothing. I have everything. You ask me, I give it to you. I wash you. I cleanse you. I fill you with my presence. You are righteous. You are as without sin. And that takes place through faith in Jesus Christ. So Jesus died for us. He's the one who knew no sin. He's the perfect sin offering. He took upon himself our sin. He received our punishment. But by faith, we receive his forgiveness and we're made right with God through him. Romans 4, 5 says, to him that works not but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And so you can pray as a righteous person because you've been made righteous by the blood of Christ. That doesn't mean that you go off and just live a life that's unrighteous. Because a person who's a righteous person does evidence righteousness in the way that they live. It's just not a self-generated righteousness. It's a righteousness that comes through faith in Christ. So as he's speaking concerning this, he says, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. But he goes on to give us an example. Elijah, notice verse 17. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. He prayed again. The heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Elijah, notice how he says, I want to look at Elijah for a few moments with you. Notice in verse 17 that Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Elijah, the prophet Elijah, one of the best-known prophets in the Old Testament. And he's saying he was an ordinary man, but he worshipped an extraordinary God. Elijah ministered during the time of the reign of a man who was very wicked. This man's name was Ahab. And Ahab was an evil pagan man. And he had an evil pagan wife. And all of you know her, even if you're not even a Christian, even if you're a new Christian, you all know who she is because we used to use the term to speak of women who were, didn't have a good reputation. They used to say, she's a Jezebel. Well, that was his wife's name. Jezebel. And so if you were brought someone home to your mama and your mama said, would you bring in that Jezebel here for her? She wasn't saying something nice because <laughs> Jezebel was an evil woman. And, and he was a, a man who did much evil, much evil in the, in the kingdom of, of Israel. In 1 Kings 16, 30 through 33, it says, Ahab was the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. It came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took as his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians. And he went and served Baal and worshipped him. Then he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Ahab made a wooden image. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Elijah was a fearless reformer. When you read your Bible and you see him, he was a fearless reformer who spoke to authority. One of the things that, that I've seen in the history of my walk with the Lord, and I've seen this in in history in the churches. Anytime 
the church gets close to power, there's a great danger there because we can be seduced by it. But he wasn't. He wasn't a man who was seduced by the power of a king. He was a man who rebuked the king. And when you read the Bible concerning him, even as we're looking at him right now, he's known for various things, including being a man who is mighty in, in prayer. When it says to us, though, that he was a man with a nature like ours, we need to remember that, and I'll show you this in a moment, but we need to remember that he had a, uh, a competition with some prophets, some false prophets, and, and, um, and uh, God showed himself victorious in this particular competition, and at the end of, the, of uh, God demonstrating himself to be God and the false prophets being demonstrated that they were false, uh, in a place called Mount Carmel, he left and he found himself in a wilderness, in a cave, and he was moaning how he was the only one who was, who was righteous and none left in the nation and all. So even though he was a man whom God used in tremendous ways, uh, he, he, he's recorded as God giving him um, opportunities to see wonderful things done. There were many miracles done at the hands of Elijah, for example, uh, he multiplied flour and oil for a widow who was starving. He, he raised uh, the widow's son. Res she, he was resurrected when he died through his hands. He, he defeated the prophets of Baal. He um, called fire down from heaven to consume some soldiers. He used his mantle, dropped it on the Jordan, and it split, and he went across it and all. He, God used him in amazing ways. He was a man who yielded to discouragement. He was a man like us. He was a man with a nature like ours. He wasn't a perfect man, but he was a man who had a, a perfect God. And, and when you read about him, this is what James is speaking about. He's speaking about Elijah. And again, in verse 17, he was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed earnestly that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't rain on the land for three years and six months. So in 1 Kings 17, verse 1, it reads, Elijah the Tishbite from Tishba and Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. And that's what James is pointing out. He's pointing out it didn't rain for three and a half years at the word of Elijah. And notice in verse 17 how it says that he, he prayed earnestly. When you look at that account in 1 Kings 18, verses 41 through 46, uh, those verses tell us that Elijah went up to Mount Carmel. He crouched on the ground with his face on his knees, and he prayed. He did so seven times. And at the end of his prayer, the sky turned black with clouds, and there was a heavy shower. And so he's speaking about his fervency, how he prayed and sought the Lord, and how that God moved. He was a man with a sin nature, but God heard his cry. Like Psalm 27, verse 7, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me, answer me. He prayed, verse 18 says, and the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. The drought and the famine ended at his prayer. So the point he's making is God works miracles and it's reasonable to believe that he will bless us too. So when you go before the Lord and you say, God, in the name of Jesus Christ, and you do so with a heart of righteousness because you've been made right with God, when you confess your sin and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, but Lord, in Jesus' name, I ask that you would touch this person. Very often that person will be touched by the Lord. Not every time, but very often that person will. Remember, if God worked miracles in the Old Testament and God worked miracles in the New, there's no reason why he can't work miracles now. I don't know a Bible verse that tells me he doesn't. I don't know a single scripture that says that he isn't able. So what I do is I just entrust myself to him because there's this old show that I used to watch when I was a kid called Father Knows Best. Well, Father does know best. My Father knows best. So that's why I trust him, and that's what he's speaking about. So he begins by saying, confess your trespasses that you may be healed. He speaks of Elijah being a man with a nature like ours. And then he goes on in verse 19 to say this, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. So we looked at confession, we look at prayer, and now we're going to look at restoration.
Notice how he says in verse 19, if anyone among you wanders from the truth. So James is concluding his letter by writing about people wandering. What is he saying when he speaks of wandering from the truth? Well, we need to believe or understand that for the Christian, truth isn't theoretical and it's not simply philosophic, it's moral. Christians realize that there is such a thing as truth and that believing in truth has ramifications. So to be grounded in Scripture produces a solid foundation for living a good life. To reject such a thing as truth produces a worldview that translates into an amoral life. Getting in the Word of God is a very important discipline. It's the beginning of the year, guys. Start reading your Bible through for this year. My wife, Marie, and I, I, I read on my own. My wife has read on her own for all the years of our marriage and even in our dating. I, I, I've never been one who likes to sit down and read out loud to my wife. I just have never been. She reads, I read, and God speaks to my heart. That's the way I've been for all of these years. So this year I told Marie, I'm going to be reading the Bible through in the year. And she says, oh, good, you can read to me. And I was going, oh, God. Because I have to read and concentrate and read and concentrate and read. I have to read several times. You know, I have a, a, a bit of a learning disability, and so I have to spend time on the words. I have to look at them. I have to think them through, and, have that, and that's how I read. I have to do that. You know, it may seem, I've never even admitted this in front of anybody here. I'm admitting it to you. Um, I, I have a, a learning disability in that. I have to read several times the same thing. My son David's exactly like me. He has to read through it and then read through it and then read through it. That's me. And so I, I read better by myself. So I always read by myself. Now my girl's saying, no, you can read to me. And I'm going, ah, curses. But, you know, uh, <laughs> so we've been doing that. So at night we're reading. There are a lot of programs. We have them here at the church. There are read through the Bible in a year Bibles that we have. I, en I encourage you to do that, husbands and wives especially. I encourage you to do that. Get in the Word of God together, you know, and especially husbands, find the scriptures that really slap her around. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Wives, well, submit to your husband. Isn't that on every page of the Bible? I seem to think of that every time I read it. But no, I, I, I'm saying that to you because that, that, that's what you want. You want to know what the truth is? How are you going to know what the truth is? Listen, as parents, it's been said, and I agree with this, if we don't teach the children, our children, to believe in God, the world will teach them not to. If we don't teach our children to believe the word of God, the world will teach them not to. That they get. Yeah, thank you, Christian teachers. I don't know how many Christian teachers I have in here, but let me, from the bottom of my heart and for all of us, let me say to you, we love you, and we thank you for your influence on our children. I thank you for that. I really do. Because there are a lot of people who don't believe in truth. They don't. And sometimes they're teaching our children all the way to the university level. They don't believe in truth. For them, it's a philosophic. It's a theory. But for us as believers, it's a person. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So truth is moral. It is a person. And we have a relationship with truth. When you read your Bible, you'll see this. You see, uh, we love the truth. Uh, Psalm 119, 97, the psalmist said, Oh, how I love your law. It's my meditation all the day. We're to obey the truth. In John 14, 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. We speak the truth. Ephesians 4, 15 says, Speak the truth in love. We've been set free by truth. John 8, 32, you shall know the truth. The truth shall make you free. And so with this in mind, truth can be wandered from. The word wander means to stray. You can stray away from truth. You can wander away. And that's what a backslider does. They become lost as they wander away from the Lord. But the fact is, people who wander from the truth are not satisfied. Their lives are miserable. They had tasted at one time the Lord's goodness, and then they turn away. In Proverbs 13, 15, it says, Good understanding gives favor, but the way of a transgressor is hard. And James is making it clear that some people wander away from Jesus. And, and it happens very often through deception uh, by false teachers who preach a false message. 
James says, again, notice, that they wander, they stray from the truth, the truth of Christian doctrine that reveals Christ to us. They no longer walk in the manner that they ought to walk because bad teaching has corrupted them. They're seduced from the truth. They no longer follow the truth of the gospel. So James is telling them that it's of great importance to care about other people. One of the dangers of being in a group like this is that you can choose to sit in one place this week, and if you come back the next, you can sit somewhere else, and you never get to know anybody. You're just kind of there. You're just a person in a group of people. A lot of people look at the church like a, like a bus. We're all sitting down facing the same direction, but we don't know the passengers around us, and that's the way we do it. We can go in the same direction and not know the people around us. That's not what the church was designed to be. The church was designed to be a family of God, a community of believers that shared our lives together. And false teachers come in, and they begin to, to bring false teaching to people, and they begin to be seduced, and they begin to wander away from the truth. And because they don't have a brother that goes to turn them back, they end up wandering alone. They're being seduced. They're being seduced away from the, the truth of the gospel. And so we're supposed to care about one another. Every genuine Christian has is to have concern for a fellow believer that, that that brother may walk or that sister may walk properly. And there, there's nothing that gives me more joy than, than seeing believers living for Jesus Christ. In 3 John verse 4, it says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And so truth is something you can wander away from. But here's the question. What are we to do when we see someone going in the wrong direction? What do you do? You know, today is the first uh, Sunday of the new year. Maybe today was a resolution for some who came today to this church or other churches. It's a, you know, it's the beginning of the year. I'm going to start going to church. And you're probably going to lose 100 pounds too. You know, I mean, we make that resolution, you know, and then how long do we actually go through and actually do it? You know, a lot of people's resolutions are, are turned away from very quickly. No, we go to church not because we have to or we're making a resolution too. You know, and if we don't go, bad things happen. No, we, we go because we get fed and we have fellowship with God and His Spirit. We love to worship Jesus Christ, and that's why we go. And when you have that kind of relationship with God and people, then you're going to have somebody who's going to interfere in your life. You're going to have somebody who loves you enough to tell you the truth. You're going to have somebody who cares about you because not everybody has somebody who loves them enough to tell them the truth. So we need each other, guys. We need each other desperately. We need to help one another. We need to encourage one another. I was sharing with First Service today that I have a friend of mine, and, and he began to isolate himself uh, from, from people. And, 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 and I've known him for many years, and so I, I contacted him, and I said, um, we need to get together. Let's get together. And we did. We had some coffee, and we were visiting and all. And, and as we're having coffee together, I began to share with them, and, I, and it, as friends do, because, again, I've known them a very, very long time. But I said, you know, I um, just want you to know I'm, I, that you're isolating yourself, and um, it's not a good thing, because the Scripture says that a man who isolates himself uh, rages against all wise counsel. And, and uh, the first thing that, that God ever declares to be not good is that the man should be alone. And, and, and the body of Christ is a community of believers, fellow believers who can lift one another up when one falls. Woe unto the man who has no friend to help him get up when he falls. So we need each other. Uh, men need other men and women need other women and all of that because we're a family. And, and guys, if you don't have somebody in your life, think about it for a moment, please. Just for a moment. Who do you have in your life? Let me be pointed with you. Who do you have in your life? Who can say you're going the wrong direction that you don't get mad at? That you will look at and you'll say, busted, you're right. Who do you have? Yeah, I, I have my wife <laughs> every day. I have my wife, obviously. Marie is able to tell me, and she does, if I'm going in the wrong direction, she does. And guess what? Do I like it? No. No, are you kidding? Are you kidding? Woman, submit thyself. No. 
Do I like it? Do I like being corrected? Am I somebody who wakes up in the morning saying, Jesus, please, may I be corrected 50 times today? No. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. And when someone loves you enough to tell you the truth, thank God every day that you have that person in your life. Thank God every day that you have someone who's willing to take the risk to say to you, you're going in the wrong direction. Because like Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? And God said, indeed you are. Indeed you are. That's what you are. We are our brother's keepers. We are to care about one another, and not just on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, where we like to post a lot of stuff to strangers whom we call friends. We, we need somebody in our life who, who, who can actually put their arms around me, somebody who can look me directly in the eye, somebody who knows me, not as just that person who stands up there, but somebody who's got a real life and real feelings and real real victories and, and real struggles. That's what we need. That's what we need. And when you have somebody that you know that's not doing well, a lot of people just ignore it. Well, you know, God will hunt them down. But you know what? Sometimes he does. God does through you, through that phone call, through that walking up and seeing them. When they come in, like some, some of you today may not have been in, in fellowship here for, for a while. You haven't been in church for whatever reason, good or bad, you haven't. And, and you may walk in, and somebody may walk up and say, oh, go, oh, look, the prodigal son has returned. You know, I'm going to go kill the fatted calf. And then the prodigal son says, I want to kill you. No, you don't. No, you don't do that. What you do is you look at him and you say, how you been? I missed you. I've been thinking of you. How are you? I didn't have any way to connect with you. How are you? What's going on? And then, oh, don't get so personal. Don't get so personal. You shouldn't get so personal. Sometimes the people who are saying you're getting too personal are the ones who are posting stuff on Facebook. Oh, I'm at the doctor's office. My tooth hurts. <laughs> really, ooh, how sad. <laughs> who did you whine to before you had Facebook? <laughs> Anybody know what I mean by that? You see a lot of that. I fell down and hurt myself. Boo-hoo. Okay, fine. I'm sorry. I wish I was there. I could touch your little head. <laughs> I, need, I need truth incarnated. I already have a Savior who is, but God touches me through human beings. And when you see someone wandering from the truth, there are things that you're supposed to do. You seek them out sometimes and share with them. Remember Luke 15, 4, where Jesus said, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, doesn't leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? You see, again, sometimes it's difficult to share the truth with someone you know is in error because your own faults loom large. You can feel unqualified to speak with them. That's why it's important to guard your walk. It puts you in a position of having character. And character is necessary for correction. When I was, before I was saved, I had people on occasion, not often, but on occasion, there would be somebody who would say, you shouldn't smoke pot. Shouldn't smoke pot. It's bad. But they're drinkers. Yes, sir. You shouldn't drink. And I'd, I'd look at them, I'd say, and, and you, should, you shouldn't drink. Who are you? To tell me that I shouldn't do this when you're doing the same thing yourself. Well, this is legal. But see, you, you say you can drink and not get drunk, but I've never seen you drink and not get drunk. So how do you do that? How do, see, so have you ever been lectured like that? I have. Have you? And if, if, you, if you're preaching to me, put it into practice yourself. That's how I felt. If you're going to tell me not to do something, show me how not to do that. But don't tell me that it's bad to do that. Somebody's real overweight telling me you shouldn't eat that. That's bad for you. I'm looking at you. Come on, Santa Claus. <laughs> you got to be kidding me. Don't lecture me. That's human nature. But listen, 
When somebody really is living out what they're telling you, you can get as mad as you want, but you can't point a finger at them and say they're not doing it. That's character. And I can be corrected by truth because sometimes somebody without character is speaking the truth, and I'll, I'll just grab the truth, but I don't think they're applying it. Most of the time, I can be corrected by someone who lives out what they're giving out. And that's very important. It's very important to live what you give. That's why in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, it says, If a man is overtaken in, in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. You who are spiritually mature, restore such a one. Not just anybody running up, correcting, correcting, correcting. You who are spiritually mature, correct such a one. And consider yourself. Look at your own life. One finger at them and three fingers at you. Consider yourself, lest you also be tempted. Be careful. Be careful. And that's the whole point, is that if you're going to bring correction to somebody, live out what you give out. Live it out. Are you perfect? No. But at least you'll be known for your sincerity, that you're wanting to live out what you're giving out to somebody else. And that's very important. And so restoration, what we're looking at here is someone wandering and how to restore them. Because he says that, listen, listen again, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, we're talking about restoring, res recovering and restoration. Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the air of his way will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Now, the great example I want to use right now is found in John 21. Would you turn your Bibles with me to John chapter 21? I want to show you something here about one who had been restored by the name of the Apostle Peter. It's found in John 21, and we're going to be looking together in just a moment at verses 15 through 19. But let me lay a foundation for you, and then I'll read those scriptures to you. As I begin this, on the night that Jesus was uh, betrayed, he told his disciples that they were going to scatter from him. Matthew 26, 31 says, Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Well, the apostle Peter was there and he was upset when he heard that and he even argued about it. In Mark 14, 29, Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. In Mark 14, 31, he insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. Well, later on that evening, Jesus was taken to the home of a man by the name of Annas to be interrogated. And it was there that Peter denied knowing Jesus, and he did so, like Jesus said, three times. What's going to happen to him? He failed Christ. Is that the end of the road for him? Is that the end of his story? He failed the Lord. He, he, he denied him. You see, right now, as I speak, there are some believers who are laboring under self-condemnation right here, right now. You live in regret, you live in failure and loneliness, the bondage of a burdened heart. You need to remember that Jesus is the bondage breaker. You need to remember that he can heal you, and he will. Psalm 34, 18 says, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart, save such as have a contrite spirit. We need to understand that God works to restore those who fall. He delights in healing broken lives. He delights in mending broken hearts. In Psalm 23, 1 through 3, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. The word restore in the ancient language of Hebrew means to repair or refresh. He repairs me. He refreshes my soul. He's the good shepherd. We know that Peter had had contact with Jesus on two occasions within eight days. You see that in chapter 20. But chapter 21 of John's gospel is his record of a third encounter with, with Peter uh, prior to his ascension. You see, during all of this time, Peter has been living with the knowledge that he denied Jesus Christ. His wound hasn't been healed. And if it's not healed, he can't be fully used. He had thought himself to be strong. Peter thought that he was unable to fall. And we can believe ourselves strong, and yet we stumble, and we fall, and we condemn ourselves. Here's a newsflash that none of us need. God is aware of our weaknesses. 
and he's not surprised by them. You think that you've ever failed and got up in heaven and said, I didn't think they'd do that, ever? You know, God knew what a mess we were, and he still saved us. You ever thank him for that? He knew what a mess you are, and I am. He knew what I would do with his message, and he saved me anyway. That's because God is a restoring God. He's a loving God. And so we're going to see that here with, with the Apostle Peter. His denial had occurred three weeks before. He hadn't forgotten his own words. He, his words, I'm, I'm sure, haunted him like we read in Psalm 51.3. I know my transgressions, my sin is always before me. I can't escape its presence. It haunts me. Sin can't be swept under a carpet. It can't be forgotten as if it never happened. It isn't something you ignore because sin will haunt you. It'll torment you. You can't deny its existence. You can't excuse it as a mistake. You can't say it was an error. You can't say it was a mental lapse, a, a culturally acceptable behavior. You can't explain it away to receive healing and to have peace and restoration. It has to be brutally dealt with. That's how sin has, it has to be dealt with brutally. It has to be recognized. It has to be acknowledged. It needs to be confessed. It needs to re be repented of. It needs to be completely forsaken. I I've seen recently more than one invitation, we call them altar calls, where the, the individual who is giving people the invitation is failing to say, you need to repent. Because without repentance, there's no turning around. It isn't just, oh, I'm just going to come to Jesus as, just as I am. No, wait a minute. You come to Jesus in need of a Savior, but you repent from your sin. You say, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. Forgive me, Lord. I turn from it. The word repent means just uh, do 180. Lord, I I've been going in this direction. I repent. I turn around. The first message that John the Baptist gave was repent. The first message Jesus gave in the Gospel of Matthew is repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent is the first word of the Gospel. You don't enter into heaven with all your sins. You repent from them, and that's what confession comes in, and that's where the, uh, the purging of the blood of Christ, washing us and cleansing us, that's how that all works. But I've, I've, I've seen too many people who have prayed prayers but never repented from their sin. Do you hate your sin? Do you hate it? David said, my sin is ever before me. He said, my body is drying up from within. I hate this, and I have to be rid of it. That's how I got saved. That's how I got saved. I was sorry and sorry so many times, and I regretted it a, a lot. I regretted things a lot. I did. It wasn't that I didn't have a conscience. It's that I didn't repent. I felt bad that I hurt that person. I felt bad that I did this. I felt bad that I hurt them. That's how I felt. I felt bad, but I did it again until one day I said, God, I don't want to do this anymore. I still remember the prayer I, I prayed, God, I'm sick, and I need your help. God, I'm sick, and I need your help. Help me, God. Help me, God. I need to be different. I need to be different. I hate what I am. I need to be new. That's how I got saved. Weeks later, that's how I heard the gospel, and that was the promise. If you turn from your sin and repent and confess, you can be forgiven and healed. And that's what happens. And see, Jesus is here to, to heal. Jesus is here to restore those broken lives. And, and that's what he's doing. In, in this particular instance here, as we look at it in a moment, Jesus has made a meal for his disciples. He, he gave them fish and bread that he prepared for them. And the meal more than likely had been eaten in a tense silence. And we need to remember in, in chapter 21 that Peter had, had led the disciples back into their former lives. They'd been out fishing. But now there they are on the, on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and, and they're having a meal that Jesus prepared for them, and the tension must have grown steadily. They're sitting with Jesus. They're the, alone on the shore. And so when the, they, they finished breakfast, Jesus begins to speak. Notice verse 15. They had eaten breakfast, and Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. 
He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Restoration. Let's look at that for a moment. They've been sitting there in silence. It would seem the silence is now broken and a question is asked. Peter, do you love me more than these? Peter, do you love me more than these other men love me? That's what you said recently. And those words were spoken with gentleness, but they must have torn Simon's heart. He's confronting Peter, but exposing him that he might heal the pain so he might restore him. Do you love me? Loving Jesus is where healing and ministry begins. In verses 15 and 16, you have a word play here, the word love. The word love is, there's two different words that are translated here by the English word love. The Greek word is agape, and the other word is phileo, and it's an interplay. Jesus is saying, Simon, do you love, do you agape me? But Simon is saying, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. Agape is a God kind of self-sacrifice, and phileo is friendship love. It's where you get the name Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. Philadelphia, philos, phileo. It's a brotherly love. Do you agape me? I phileo you. Do you agape me? I phileo you. Then he says, do you phileo me? Jesus actually uses the third time the word phileo. Do you phileo me? I'm willing to accept you on the level that you're able to give. What does this reveal to us? Well, one, Peter no longer is proud of his love. He's in need of love. He discovered that though his denial was great, Jesus' love and grace is greater still. (laughs) Though they all forsake you, yet I never will. I will die for you. Will you really? You're going to forsake me. No, I won't. Yes, you will. And yes, he did. I said I would die for you, but I denied you. I was in love with you, but now I realize my love is weak. What's it reveal? Well, Peter was no longer proud of his love. Second, he discovered that God knew everything about him, but would use him anyway. God isn't looking for perfection. He looks for repentance and humility. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12, it says, Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. He's not looking for perfection. He's aware of us. He knows that we're human beings and we fail. He's not surprised by that. But as he's doing this, Jesus commissions him for ministry. And that ministry is going to come from a place of brokenness. In Psalm 51, verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. See, Peter, you're to tenderly nourish and care for my lambs and my sheep. And your pride and your arrogance and your self, self-confidence needed to be broken in order that you might become confident in me. God will use you after he's broken you. He will use you. Because you're able to listen to somebody who's going through something without thinking in the back of your mind, I can't imagine how you do that. How do you do that? How would you get? No, I know how you could have done that. I've done that and worse. I know. I know the place of brokenness, and many of you do too. I know the place of failure. I know that place where I've said, God, I can't even be used by you. Look at me. Look what I've done with your, with your mercy and your grace. Look what I've done with your message. Look what I am. And I'm such a failure. I, I don't live the way that I preach. And the Lord has broken me and broken me and broke. And he's done the same for you because he works out of the place of our brokenness. Not that it's an excuse to go back and sin. No, it's that you might learn lessons that keep you from being arrogant and prideful. And the third thing is he learns that God will deepen him as he heals him. Peter needed to know he was loved and he needed to hear that from Jesus. Psalm 51, verse 8 says, Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Jesus' word of love to him was a simple command to go back and minister, not fish. And this is how we're to be with those who have failed, but have returned to church. 
return to the Lord. We encourage them, we love them, and we welcome them back. It's good to see you. We've missed you. It's a blessing to have you with us. You may think you're just a, an invisible face in a sea of other faces, but, but you matter, and it's good to have you with us because we're a family, and we're not a complete family when one of the members are, is not there. And when you're here with us, we're grateful that you are because you're going to walk in the truth, and that ministers to us. We need to encourage people. We need to love them. And we need to be their welcoming committee. What do you do when someone wanders from the truth? Well, James in chapter 5, verse 20, and I'll close, says, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way saves a soul from death. It's going to cover them. It puts them in the place of repentance. It puts them in a place of restoration. The Bible in 1 Peter 4, 8 says, above all things have fervent love among yourselves. Love shall cover the multitude of sins. In Psalm 32, verse 1, blessed is he, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. The word blessed can speak of being happy, overwhelmingly rejoicing. Blessed is the one, happy is that one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. When Jesus restored the apostle Peter, Peter didn't deny him again. Peter went on to serve him, to feed the lambs, to tend and care for the sheep and lambs, and ended up laying his life down for Jesus, his master, never again to betray him. Restoration. Some of you in this room need restoration. There's no doubt there's no doubt you need to be restored. Let me close by saying Jesus is here to restore you. He will wash you. He will cleanse you. He will restore you because he loves you. Don't forget that. He loves you.